had to fulfill a requirement as an undergraduate to take some whole organism course. And a botany class kind of fit my timetable. It had pretty good reviews. As it turns out, it would change my life. Hi, I'm Sean Lum. I'm a botanist and ecologist. I teach, I'm a lecturer at the NTU Asian School of the Environment, and I'm also a member and volunteer of the Nature Society Singapore, a local Singapore-based uh, conservation NGO. I've always been close to nature, certainly to wildlife, because my family, even though they had no training in biology, they just loved animals. We had all kinds of pets fish, dogs, birds, and also we spent a lot of time outdoors. My grandmother, I grew up in Hawaii, lived just across the street from the beach. I ended up either volunteering or working or doing something involving plants and ecology. There was the founding of what was called the Malayan Nature Society, and in 1954, um, an expanding MNS uh, established branches throughout a few places in Malaya, so Selangor, Penang, Singapore. So I would say that we trace the origins of Nature Society Singapore to the founding of that MNS Singapore branch in 1954. And since that time, the 1980s, it's increasingly become part hobby and part advocacy in Nature Society. So I joined just maybe towards the end of that transition. I think as an educator, especially now, you know, as I'm really approaching the end of my career as opposed to the beginning, you get a chance to work with young people who still have this long runway, this future of 50 years where they can really make a positive impact all around them. And that's what I think I love about NGO work because it's not necessarily people who come together because they do it as professionals, but no matter their, whatever they do in life, um, they're there because they love nature and the environment. There's a few very wonderful, distinct forest types in Singapore, even though we're a really small place. For example, here at the foot of Bukit Tima, which is home to maybe the largest continuous piece or contiguous piece of original old growth or primary forest on the upper part of Bukit Tima, which has not been logged before. So essentially we have the original primary forest surrounded by a regenerated secondary forest in areas that had been cleared before. If you go to the coast, you can find these um, intertidal forests, if you want to call that, the, the mangroves. It's maybe as much as 13 to 15 percent of Singapore's land area was once covered in these intertidal mangrove forests. And there's one other type of very distinctive forest called the freshwater swamp. There's also a few, you know, um, variations on this, like the cliffs of, say, the southern islands or at Labrador, there's what's called a, a coastal forest, and then on the beach you have a, a beach forest. I would say maybe the so icon of this so-called coastal hill dipterocarp forest is something called Soraya or Moranti Soraya. Um, otherwise known as uh, Shoria Criticii, and it's, you know, those are more up-to-date on the naming, called the Rubro Shoria Criticii. Beautiful tall tree, grows up to maybe 50 meters tall. Looks a bit from a distance like uh, cauliflower on a stick, which isn't a really romantic sounding description, but it's a beautiful tree. So in addition to the Soraya, um, I, I, I suppose if you were to ask me, is there any particular group of trees that, or plants that I, I maybe drawn to, one would be trees with very large seeds. And the, and the reason I say that is because in our local forests, such as Bukitima, we don't have the kind of large animal that would have dispersed or moved around these seeds to help them regenerate. These trees still survive, though, in the forest, even without their main seed dispersers. So what is allowing their continued survival. And so that group has always been interesting to me, in particular one called the nutmegs, 
uh, related to the nutmeg we use as a spice. And some of them might have seeds as large as five centimeters across. That's a big seed. There's a lot of reasons why I think forests are very important. Nowadays, maybe conservationists or the nature community uh, have always sought to you know, speak the language of people who make decisions, whether that, uh, that's in policy or in big business. And so you often hear, and it's true, that forests regulate the environment, whether it's climate, they do things like store carbon, they provide recreational services. I mean, in Bukitima, you see thousands of people using the forest every day. Without that, where would they go and how would their mental state be without this ability to commune with nature? I do think there's a responsibility to make sure that our children, grandchildren, and generations, many generations from now, will have the same opportunity to experience these magical places just as we have. We combine our efforts into something that's really big, uh, earth-changing in a literal way. So I think that that's one thing that we can do. The sweet spot for me would be actually that things that we do to protect the environment, to look out for each other, to make sure that nobody gets left behind in this development of our world and that nature plays a big part of everyone's future. I think when we get to the point where we're doing it because it comes naturally to us, that we're not consciously trying to save nature, but in a way that we're thoughtful and it becomes part of our everyday actions, I think that would be where we want to be. Fortunately, we have lots of resources available these days which makes these incredibly diverse habitats so much more accessible, whether those are apps, online tools, various forums. You can join a nature group, you attend many public lectures, come to exhibitions like these. But again, maybe one of the most important thing is just come to the forest, go to a mangrove, see a coral reef, feel the habitat first, and once you have that affinity, everything else should just flow naturally.